my name's Mark Pragnell. I've got the glorious job title of Head of Commission Projects. Uh, there is no point in trying to explain that whatsoever um, at Capital Economics. Um, Capital Economics uh, is a, an economics consultancy. Um, um, we've, we've also, we also now have a rich parentage, um, apparently. Uh, we had what they call a strategic investment um, by, a, by a private equity firm last year. And with that, we've now turned global. Um, although we are headquartered in London, we now have offices in Toronto, um, New York opened recently, uh, Singapore and just opened in Sydney as well. What they're doing in the offices, I haven't got a clue, um, but we are a global economics, macro, uh, macroeconomics consultancy now. Uh, we were founded back in 99 by a chap called Roger Bootle, um, who was then the global chief economist for HSBC Group, uh, and that was a good job title then. Um, he's... He's, 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 he's managed to do well for himself. He's, you may well see him on the television quite a bit. And he's, uh, he's written some quite impressive books, such as The, uh, the Death of Inflation, just before inflation went up, um, although it has gone down again as there, thereafter. Um, and he's just put one out recently called The, the, the Trouble with Europe, um, which may be slightly topical, but you never know. Um, OK. What I would like to do today is um, basically... Uh, run through, you know, I, given it was the budget yesterday, given that I am an economist, I am meant to be talking about the prospects for the UK economy, it would be silly for me to stand up and try and get away without doing anything other than recycle and presentation that was produced before the budget. Um, so there are a few slides on the budget, and I will give you what are my initial thoughts um, on budget 2016. Um, but more importantly, what I want to move on to do is give some idea about what the prospects are for, for the UK economy and consumers over the next two years. And importantly, we need to think a little bit about you know, where have we got to, where are we going? Why am I doing this? Well, partly because I've been asked to do so. But predominantly, the reason for this is to give you some macro context to the discussions throughout the day. You're going to be thinking about how on earth do we, how on earth do we plan about our marketing, how on earth do we plan our, our campaigns moving forward. Hopefully what I can do this morning is start to give you some ideas about what's the broader context within which the activity will occur and whether or not to do it. Um, I always have far more slides than I should. Um, I've segmented them into four sections today. Um, you'll find out very soon what I think of Mr. Oliver. Um, However, section one is about the budget, and a budget that appears to be largely about rather good publicity-seeking um, restaurateurs um, than anything about anything else. Um, well, I, I want to just run through the macro perspective. There's a huge amount of talk at the moment about some of the sort of micro issues that came out from yesterday's budget. Actually, it's a moderately, because let's be blunt about it, budgets aren't the most exciting things around other than for economists. It's a moderately interesting budget as well from a macro perspective as well, which I don't think has been picked up yet in the press. Um, then what I want to do is I want to talk about the general macro, macro economy. I want to look at where we've got through through 2015 and think about where we're going this year and beyond. And fundamentally, what we've seen up to now is actually we've seen a pretty strong consumer recovery since about 2010. Um, which is about the time I... Th no, 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 it was later than that, wasn't it? I, I would have said otherwise. Um, so I want to, want to start to think a little bit about the, about the economy and where it's going. Then let's just discuss some of the issues around um, the risks that the UK economy faces. And I'm going to focus on two, um, not because they're the only two, but because they're the two that most people have been talking about. But also, I think they capture a lot of what's going on. Um, so I want to talk about China and world prospects. And then let's be blunt, everyone else is talking about it. I suppose I ought to talk about Brexit as well at the end. OK. So that's the layout of today's presentation. Um, in terms of house rules, um, I talk a lot. I gabble on a lot. Quite often, I sort of talk to it in different directions. People can't understand what I'm saying. Please shout if you can't understand or if you can't hear me. And also, if you think I'm talking absolute nonsense, you are welcome to get up and say you're talking absolute nonsense. I will probably ignore you, but give it a go. Um, I will also, I'll also try and leave a bit of space at the end of this session for some, for some questions from the audience, um, 
before we move on. I will also be around at the refreshment break at the end of session one. And if you do have any burning questions that aren't addressed, and I'm sure you will, uh, we're not the burning questions for me is another matter. But if you do have any burning questions, then please come up and find me at, uh, during the, during the um, refreshment break as well. Right. The Naked Chef and a Budget Exposed. Um, I thought that was a good pun, actually, but clearly not. Um, <laughs> I worked really hard on that. That was what I was most of last night. <laughs> I'm not going to say a great deal about Jamie Oliver. I want to try and get to the, the meat of the macroeconomics of, of yesterday's budget, because there's some important macroeconomics there. Before I get there, it is worth saying about what we have gone through and where we have got so far. And actually, I've shown this slide so many times, but it's a really important one. Um, what we have been through post-2008 has been an absolute seismic shift of an economic change. The recession was the biggest recession this country has gone through in not just living memory, but in statistically um, calculated memory, as it were. That graph shows you what we call in economics GDP or gross domestic product, basically economic activity in the UK. It shows how, it's, how it went up in a reason, relatively straightforward upward trend pre-2008 and subsequently went down after the financial crisis. It went down in total by 6%, which is no small change. Um, but not only did it go down a very large amount, that 6% is roughly the amount it went down in the UK during the 1930s Great Depression, um, it stayed down for an awfully long period of time. It took us five and a half years just to recover the ground lost after 2008. That, by the way, is the longest period in any recession for recovery to occur. And now we're still a good 13 to 14% below where we would have otherwise have been if the pre-2008 trends had continued. Thankfully, 2008 is starting to become a distant memory. However, its economic effects are not. That is the background to the budget of this year. What has that background done? Well, it's meant that in the UK, we still have probably one of the most structurally problematic economies amongst the, the major, major advanced economies. So here are the G7, as they like to call them, the, the seven largest industrialized economies in the world. Um, excludes China, so you can argue about one, but still. And what this graph shows you is it shows you the addition of the current account, i.e. the government public, sorry, the current account, i.e. The, the trade in goods and services deficit or surplus with other countries, plus the balance, the surplus or the deficit on the, of government annual spending. And when you add those two together, you've got some sort of scale of imbalance or in, in an economy. It's, I'm not saying this is necessarily an imbalance which has to be unwound instantly, but it just gives you an idea about how well structured an economy is. And the UK remains the economy in the G7 with this biggest structural imbalance, this biggest structural deficit. Germany has a structural surplus, although that in itself isn't necessarily a good thing. What you'd like to feel is you've got an economy which is, has some form of balance. We are still a long way away from that. In fairness to Mr. Osborne, and my views on Mr. Osborne aren't that far away from my views on, 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 on the celebrity chef named earlier. Um, in terms of Mr. Osborne, actually he has done a decent job so far of reducing the government's annual deficit. So in terms of how much the government spends each year versus how much it, it, um, it gets in in taxes and elsewhere, actually he's pretty well halved that deficit over the period that he's been in charge. Not bad going, actually. And given where he started, and actually quite an impressive job. Um, could he have done better? Is he done the right things? All questions you know, still to be answered. But actually, in terms of eliminating the public sector deficit, he hasn't done it yet, but actually he has made progress. But he's now being challenged by some significant other problems. We'll go, we'll go on and discuss them a bit later. But one of the most important things that came out from yesterday's budget was effectively the recognition by the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, which is what this, this little team within the Treasury, 
uh, supposedly independent team within the Treasury that's been set aside to, 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 to work out what the forecast should be for the UK and from which the government should do its, its, its fiscal planning. Uh, what's quite interesting is actually, in my view, um, the o since the OBR's come in and has been independent, um, you've actually seen more tweaking of government forecasts than, than you would ever did prior to that when, when they were all decided by, by, by ministers regardless. But at any rate, um, one of the most important things that came out of yesterday's announcement was a recognition by the OBR and therefore by the government um, that we've got lower rates of growth of productivity in the UK economy. So actually, previously, the OBR was quite positive about how quickly we could get back on course for GDP growth through not just employment growth, but also through productivity growth, so i.e. how much each individual person in work makes. Um, and that's looking, as if was too, that's looking as if that was too optimistic. So not only do we have um, a structural deficit, we have an economy that doesn't look as if it's got the same sort of scale of engine running that it might otherwise have had. And all of these then play into um, what looks like a much, much tougher environment within which the, the Chancellor yesterday was making his budget announcements. And given all of that, and given that you know, Mr. Osborne quite often tells us that he set a path, that path being austerity and the elimination of the deficit, he set a path, he stuck to that path, and that's why we've got where we are now. Despite that, what we actually got yesterday was a government, was a, was a budget which for the next three fiscal years in total is actually expansionary rather than, than contractionary, i.e. the government is putting in more money than it would have, would have otherwise have done into the economy rather than taking it out, spending rather than saving, spending rather than taxing. Most of the spend actually is, are various tax reductions rather than increases in public expenditure. But what you're seeing is you're seeing actually um, it's still overall the path is reduced government expenditure, but yesterday's budget reduces the extent of that austerity overall. It all though kicks in in 2019-20, which is the end of this parliament, and when he has said he wants to have a budget surplus, i.e. within that year he wants to spend less than he receives in taxes and else things. Um, so what we have is we have a rather peculiar budget, which for the next three years has deficits at higher levels than they were in the previous budget, forecast to be, yet nevertheless still manages to hit his target in 2019-20. Um, in other words, it's a fiddle. Yesterday's budget, fairly marginal in, in the grand scheme of things, but it was a little bit of a giveaway. I'll go on to in a moment to suggest who it was a giveaway to, but it was a giveaway. And actually, what I think you saw yesterday was the Chancellor taking quite a massive risk on his ability to ever hit his target of surplus by the end of the Parliament. Um, he has carefully, and I've, I've got a couple of slides, and I, I, I will go through them because I think it is quite interesting. They're a bit boring in one level, but I want to do it. Um, he's, he's basically gone through the arithmetic in order to make sure that he can show that he's going to hit his target in 2019-20. But he's, the actual actions he's done yesterday don't really make it look as if he's trying that hard. Um, now, um, I'm getting older, as we all are, and once upon a time... Oh, hang on. Ah, there we are. Once upon a time, I would have stayed up all night on, the, on, on budget night and made this a very nice graphic. Um, but I'm getting wiser now, and I realise that if you have a PDF of a government report, you can go in and you can take a snapshot of it and just put it straight into the presentation. So this is, this is, this is a direct snapshot out of the Red Book, the government budget book. Um, and people get really excited about the first chapters and the, what, what was he said. If you go to section two, there's the budget measures. And every budget always has it. It has a table of every single item in the, 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 the Chancellor has announced or is being brought in as part of, the as part of the budget, and it is costed for all, the out for all the future years. So you've got in one table the entirety of the budget measures. Um, and that's all you ever need to read 
and you can get, and as an economist, I can usually get 26 presentations out of it as well. Um, the table is quite long. It goes on for about three pages. Um, and what I've done is I've, I've just cut to the bottom here, which just gives you some idea of um, what the budget has done. So a plus is a plus for the chancellor, i.e. he gets more money. A minus is a plus for us. Um, means that the, 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 the Chancellor has lost some money, either it's, a, either it's a tax benefit to consumers or businesses, or it's an expenditure increase of government. So this year, pretty well, 2016-17, the entirety of what he said yesterday does nothing. 285 million in, the government, in government fiscal terms is a drop in the ocean, or several of them in fact. But what you've got is you've got minus seven and a half billion, minus five billion, in 2017, 18, 2018, 19, which actually is quite a substantial chunk of cash being handed out um, by the Chancellor. But magically, he manages to find 14 billion return um, just in time, increases, increases revenues or decreases expenditures by 14 billion in time for his, his, his 2019 20, 20 uh, deadline. Um, most of the things you saw in the budget yesterday aren't doing a great deal in terms of the numbers. So here are some of the interesting things in terms of personal tax. Uh, here is our wonderfully described soft drinks industry levy. Um, oh, the interesting point in this one, sorry, is that w when he spoke, he said that the money from this, the uh, soft drinks industry levy was going into school sports as if it was going all going in. Actually, what they're marking up is getting about half a billion out of the sector and putting about 200 million back into schools for it. Um, so it's actually, it is a 300 million pound net benefit to, 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 to the Exchequer. Um, but most of the measures you saw yesterday aren't really that significant on a macroeconomic scale. Um, what is very interesting is that a large chunk of his improvement back in 2020, 2019, 2020 come from resource spending adjustment, plus three and a half billion. Um, that, I think when we've looked through, the, through it, basically what they've done, or what he's done, is he's taken all of the austerity that he would have pushed through in, in terms of central government departments and back-end loaded it. So whereas, whereas up to now we were expecting a reasonable, reasonable decline in, in, in expenditure in central government, but he's let some of that go through, but he's expecting pretty well overnight an enormous amount of austerity in 2019-20. So, if that is true, and you think he can do it, 2019-2020 is a pretty dread, dreadful year. Yep. In reality, they've never once been able to get through that sort of scale of resource efficiencies in the public sector in one year. So in my view, what that t table tells us is that yesterday, the Chancellor had pretty well given up on his targets to hit surplus by 2019-2020. And really, the only reason why he went through that pretense yesterday was because he, he needed to buoy up the, the Conservative vote. Um, in advance of the Brexit um, referendum and in advance of, 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 of the election in Scotland. Um, it's still not big beer, but actually what he did do, though, is that where that money has gone, it's been relatively good for business. Um, actually, it's been good for big, big business as well as small business. Um, there's changes to corporation tax, which means that a whole raft of things that would have hit, hit big businesses over the next two years get again get pushed back to 2019-2020. Um, and there's, there's a reasonable amount in there, which is, which is, which is decent for consumers, particularly um, the mid-mass mass affluent type of households. Um, pretty good, although, let's be honest, the, the numbers aren't massive, but pretty good if you're in the sort of household income bracket of around about 50 grand or so, especially if, you're, if, you, if, you, if that's on one income as well. Um, so a budget that's been good for... A budget that's been good for... Um, businesses and consumers. So that was the budget. Let's talk now about more important things and let's talk about the economy more generally and consumers. Um, since I last spoke to an abacus event, um, things have gone pretty well, generally, in the consumer world. Um, part of the reason why they've gone well is because we've had relatively low inflation. In fact, not just relatively low inflation, we've had inflation which has been pretty well non-existent for a decent chunk of the last few months. That 
has in part, as you can see here, that in part has been due to a decline in general inflation, but more importantly, um, actually negative inflation, reducing prices in things like energy, with world oil prices going down, and food as well, commodity prices generally falling. So we've benefited from a global slowdown impacting on prices of globally traded energy and food to have low inflation here in the UK. Low inflation has meant that whereas some of my peers were suggesting we would have had increases in interest rates last year or the year before, we haven't had increases in interest rates. In fact, it still looks as if they're going to stay low, at least for a good year moving forward. We've seen unemployment improve, and it's back to, well, unemployment reduce, back down to pre-recession levels. And actually some very good signals that some of the, the growth that we're getting in the UK economy is growth that's getting us back to a more normal state post-2008. Um, for example, one of the, one of the things we did, we did see during the recession was a marked swing, actually not in employment, but in people being previously employed in full-time jobs being swung into part-time jobs. And now we're starting to see that unwind. So some of the things that were troublesome, some of the things that were quite clearly occurring as we went through the difficult periods of 2008, 2009, 2010, are starting to unwind. All positive signs. What does that mean? Well, real earnings, i.e. the amount people are earning as salaries, bonuses, taking account of inflation, have started growing again. One of the reasons why we saw such a long period of economic malaise after 2008 was because actually, as this graph shows you, for a long period, people's real incomes, the amount that they could buy with their salaries, was in decline because incomes were going up slowly or not going up at all, and we had inflation. That's swapped round now. Incomes are going up again at a relatively sensible rate, relatively trend rate, actually, and we've got low inflation. So real incomes are being on the up. And for you, you've now seen consumers back in positive territory in terms of their confidence. We've got what looks like a consumer recovery. Let's come back. A consumer recovery over the last 18 months. And then when you get into the detail, um, consumer recovery through 2015, actually a nice sustained series of quarter in, quarter out, month in, month out, actually growth in retail sales and growth in consumers' expenditure. Um, that spending has been pretty well broadly based across the categories of, 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 of retail sales, uh, with the exception of, of, of alcohol and tobacco. Um, and as you know, what we've seen since 2008 has been a massive swing in those retail sales into internet. Uh, what you've got there is you've got the blue bars tell you for each of the category of store. Um, what the growth has been overall, and the red shows you what the growth has been via internet sales. Again, massive change. And that swing now means that at least the Office for National Statistics, which is official, may not be right, but it's official, uh, the Office for National Statistics reckons that now one pound in every seven spent in the retail sector is spent online. Um, I will give Abacus um, the PDF of these slides, so they will be circulated. I'm just about to show now a couple of slides. We've got a lot of numbers on them, so don't scribble it all down. You will get it, um, but it's worth putting up in it nevertheless. Um, in terms of what the Office for National Statistics believe, um, I've, we've gone through and looked at um, who's been the strong performers in terms of um, different types of store, and by and large, everyone in this room will probably be mail order and internet only. Um, and what I've done is we've, over two pages, ranked the performers um, from good, to, from, from fast to slow, and even negative. Um, and you will see that mail order and internet only actually has been the strong, strongest growth, one of the strongest growth sectors, unsurprisingly, as a store type, not just as a, as a, as a channel, 
um, over the past three years. On the bad side, downside, um, dispensing chemists seem to have got it in the neck in 2015. I've got no idea why, but there we are. So overall, what you've had is you've had a positive couple of years. The big question is, can it continue? And there are lots of reasons, and you'll see them quite often in the newspapers, often the Daily Mail. Um, there are lots of reasons why you might be sceptical of the ability for the UK economy and for UK consumers to keep it going. The first one is that inflation will have to be on its way back up. I've already argued that part of the reason why we've done well in the last two years is because we had subdued inflation. Well, we had subdued inflation because of partly because of reducing gas, electricity and food bills. Um, they do have to reverse. Even just mathematically, if prices stabilise, that means you end up with what previously was a, a, a downward pressure on inflation being something which comes out and you just have upward pressures elsewhere in inflation. So inflation will go up. Lots of people will argue that higher interest rates are looming. And again, that's logical. If the economy grows, we can't assume we can stay in an emergency state of economic emergency state of, 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 of economic position, uh, economic policy. Um, now, whether or not it's going to happen this year or next year is another matter entirely. Um, I wouldn't expect a great deal, certainly into the next few months in the UK, and it's, every time you look at it, it looks like it's being pushed back. But certainly, um, interest rates will have to go up, policy rates will have to go up. When Osborne took power, he was talking about a balanced recovery. He was talking about getting us exporting again. He was talking about the, the, the northern powerhouse. He was talking about not having a consumer-led recovery. Well, we've got a consumer-led recovery. And in fact, we had a few periods where investment was doing well. And actually, business investment still looks moderately OK. But predominantly, the recovery, the, prep, the push in the UK is down to the consumer sector. In fact, exports have done pretty poorly over the last five years. And although, although he will, he has reduced some of the impact yesterday, we are still going through a period of austerity. There are still cuts to the welfare bills. Households, certain households will be impacted upon um, by greater austerity as we move forward. And if you are worried about the state of the UK economy, you probably will also be worried about the extent to which UK households seem to have given up saving. Um, they did it for a couple of years after 2008, but we're, still, we're now back down to levels that were as bad prior the recession. So there are lots of reasons to get worried about the UK economy. Housing market's another one. Um, Yes, there was a little bit of momentum at the end of 2015, but actually when you look at transactions, when you look at, when you look at new bar inquiries and data, actually there's a reasonable, reasonable feeling that the, the UK housing market has gone off the boil somewhat. So overall, should we be worried? Well, I accept all of those risks, I accept all of those data, but I think there are still very good reasons for us to remain optimistic about the next two years. And, you know, I am an economist. Economists forecast <coughs> nine out of the last five recessions, as they say. Um, we're, we're normally pessimistic people. Um, so doing this is a, you know, should be, should be a, a word of, 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 of encouragement. Why am I positive? Firstly, and this has been helped yesterday, we are still actually a pretty decent place, regardless of Brexit, we're still a pretty decent place to do business. And the pushing pressure down on, 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 um, on corporation tax is, a, is the right thing. If nothing else, is that actually you can't collect corporation tax. All this, non, all this stuff about, about Amazon and, and the rest, actually a part of that is because it's very difficult to capture corporation tax. Why put businesses off when we just might as well bring the rates down? Um, we've got reasonable levels of business investment. In fact, business investment came back much quicker than anyone would have expected after 2008. And importantly, 
actually the survey evidence suggests that people, that businesses still want to invest. What does that mean? Well, the OBR is worried about productivity, and they're right to be. But actually, businesses wanting to invest, an economy that's still moving forward, actually, I think possibly the prospects for productivity are somewhat better than the OBR think. <coughs> yes, inflation has to rise. It's always mathematically impossible for it to carry on where it is at the moment. But equally, we're seeing reasonable upticks in salaries as well. So although inflation might rise, one can expect wages to rise at a reasonable, reasonably similar level. So in real terms, hopefully real incomes will still be there. But importantly, there is a real big difference between now and 2007-2008. In 2007-2008, we had a household sector, consumers in the UK, that were massively over-indebted. That's not the case now. Indeed, you're seeing relatively low growth in both mortgage and unsecured borrowing. And then when you look at the scale of household debt in the UK against, for example, the ability for people to pay that debt, their incomes, that's still on, that's still on a downward, downward, downward trajectory. So debt isn't an issue, and that was one of the biggest drivers of, two, of the problems post-2007-8. Indeed, if you look more generally, there appears to be greater willingness for, 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 for mortgage, uh, for, for willingness for, for lenders to lend, which is one of the problems we've had in the first period after 2008. And the other concern that, that, that everyone has is, of course, interest rates must go up. And I think that's true. They will do. We can't have them at 0.5 or we can't have them at zero, whatever it's going to be in the, in the Eurozone. Um, but just because the policy rate goes up doesn't mean that necessarily the rate of interest charged to borrowers goes up, or to the same extent. And what that graph does there for you, it gives you an indication of the, extent, the, the difference between the policy rate, which is the one we all get excited about and we've seen in the newspapers, versus how much banks pay for their financing, versus how much it then goes on to, for example, a mortgage. And the banking sector typically works within a very narrow spread, or prior to 2008, works within a very narrow spread. The banks were making decent money, even during periods where we're talking basis points, not percentage points, so tenths and hundredths of percentage point differences um, between what they're lending out at and what the base rate is. The spreads today are substantial in comparison. So there's a fair amount of movement. Now, I because of changes to regulation, because of changes to regulation, you'll never, you'll, never, you'll never get back to a world like that. But given the extent to which we've got such a bigger gap here, there is actually quite a lot of scope for policy rates to change in the United Kingdom without there being the same scale of impact to mortgage rates or to credit card rates or whatever else. So some of those fears, I think, are overblown. And indeed, um, my colleagues back at, 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 at Capital Economics um, have what is a reasonably positive outlook for the UK economy um, with growth actually staying around about the same levels over the next couple of years as they have been this year and the last. Um, Positive. Okay. So, generally, I think there are good reasons to be positive about the UK economy. Not necessarily for strong, strong growth, but for it to be able to go steady as you can. There are, though, lots of people who will point to various things out there that could push us off course. Now, I'm going to argue that these things aren't such a worry. That doesn't mean they're not a risk. Okay? And... One of these is China and the global, and global prospects. Um, that apparently is a an abandoned housing complex in Yingku, 
I'm sure that's completely mispronounced in China. Um, but what's, what is, what is rather, rather, rather sadly, because it's been quite obvious for some time now, what has become apparent to the rest of the world is that some of the growth in China hasn't quite been as strong as they might have thought, and that some of the investments made in China haven't been as sensible as they might be. And actually, what we've got here now is a Chinese economy, which is looking a little bit worrisome. Should you here be worried about China? Well, there are lots of things about the Chinese economy at the moment which are, which are problematic. The first thing is the extent to which people are getting their cash out as quickly as possible. Certainly, the markets are very worried. Um, but some of that relates to the stock market. And to be blunt about it, the Chinese stock market bears no relation whatsoever to the Chinese economy. Um, it's neither that important in terms of Chinese domestic consumers, because very few of them actually have shares, but also it's a very narrow market. What's more interesting is what's happening to the real economy. And it is abundantly clear the real economy is slowing down. But equally, no one in their right mind could ever imagine that an economy can continue to grow by 10 or 12 percentage points every year. Um, the, the, wonder, the, wonders of, the wonders of percentage changes means that fundamentally you can't do that without taking in Mars and a few other planets to, in order to, 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 to define where the growth is going to go. Um, but we have seen a decline in growth in the Chinese economy. Part of the problem is, though, is that we can only see that in official statistics, or mostly only see that in official statistics, and the official statistics are simply nonsense. Um, you know, I've possibly suggested something about the Office of National Statistics in the UK, um, but they are, they are streets ahead of the stats you'll get from China. Um, my colleagues do some sort of statistical voodoo back at the office, and they produce this red line. Um, and they look, at, they look at things where, they look at various other sources of data in, in, in China where that people have actually gone and counted things rather than tried to estimate them. And then they try and weight that together and see if they can come up their own composite of GDP. And actually, probably, the, you know, what, we, what we reckon is that the decline was happening earlier than, than people realised through the official statistics. It has been sharper than the official statistics suggest, but probably China has not necessarily turned a corner, but has bottomed out already. Um, you can't expect double-digit growth in the Chinese economy. The Chinese economy does need to get around about 4 or 5% to keep the population, and importantly, the, in order to accommodate the migration from, the, from rural areas into the city. Um, but that looks to be about what the Chinese economy is delivering. So something there which is probably more sustainable than the newspapers would suggest. Um, what does that mean here for the UK? Actually, we are a trading nation, as everyone's very clear, clear to tell us about at the moment during the Brexit debate. Um, but our exposure to China is quite small, both in terms of our financial exposure and our exposure in terms of trading as well. More generally, China is being used as the totem to suggest that global issues will impact on the UK. And there are some issues... That's quite true. The global economy is clearly slowing. But one of the things that people will point at is they point at this very sharp decline we've seen in the value of, of trade globally. Well, the reason, or one of the biggest reasons why the value of trade has declined is because many of the things that are traded have reduced in price. Oil, energy, food. Um, and actually, a lot of the concern that people have around global trade appears rather to be dependent upon the fact that they've missed out the fact that, that the volume stayed up, but the value has gone down. And the black line, which shows you the volume of world trade, suggests that we still have a generally increasing growth in the UK, uh, growth in world trade. So overall, our view is the globe, yes, it is slowing, has slowed. It will never be back up to what you saw earlier on in the decade, but don't get too worried about global growth. And finally, Brexit. Um, I'm going to be really boring about this one, even more so, maybe. Um, this 
sums up all you need to know about economists, and especially what they can contribute to the debate on, on, on Brexit. These dots show you the various estimates by different economists or economics groups as to what the impact of Brexit might be on the UK economy as a percentage of GDP. Um, surprisingly enough, you can probably suggest, as you look there, you, you can guess that what you've got are economists and groups as you go up, move from being more left-looking to more right-looking to more UKIP defending. Um, I actually did a, a, a very detailed study um, for the Nether on the Netherlands economy, and the maths is interesting because actually it is, and a lot of it also plays out in the UK as well, the maths isn't that exciting. A lot of the issues ba balance out. I'll, give you just, I'll just give you one example on the, on the, on the, um, on the, on the against the stayers in. Um, the trade debate. We hear a lot about, oh, no, 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 we'll lose access to the single market. Um, and therefore, we'll, it'll be costly to trade. Well, of course, the European Union, or the European Common Market, was established many decades ago in order to build a union of, 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 of trading nations um, in an environment where it was very difficult and very costly to do trade. And there were tariffs everywhere, and it was very difficult to get your, 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 get your goods across borders. But another organization called the World Trade Organization has done sterling work, albeit again, pretty tedious work, done sterling work over those same decades, breaking down those barriers and reducing those tariffs for everywhere else in the world outside of the European Union. So even if we were to leave the single market, the worst case scenario is that we get treated as a, as a member of the WTO and we, bit, we trade on what they call the most favourable nations basis. Most favoured nations basis. And those tariffs actually aren't that great. They, they, are, they are high on some foods, so the, the contribution to, to inflation of food will, will change. But for the rest of it, actually the tariffs, even if you had to pay the tariffs, they're not a significant impact on, on a large number of the goods, the goods that are traded across border. Um, it, it is an impact, and it needs to be calculated, it needs to be thought through, but it's nowhere near as material as people think. And there are plenty of other examples you work through this. We're, we're actually, the economics, there was a bit on that side, a bit on that side, but in reality, it's not a particularly significant economic argument. What you know, there are, and I could, you could, you could, <laughs> actually, if you go to um, Woodford Investments, you can find our report, which, which goes through and does pluses and minuses on these things. Um, what is an issue is the issue of confidence during the process. And I think having clarity is important and actually bless them. I think by at least calling the, the, the referendum earlier than it might otherwise have been, hopefully there'll be clarity sooner rather than later. Um, and that's the results from Scotland, you know, around referenda, etc. that can be a problem. Um, but the economics are pretty balanced. For me, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain where I, you know, I'll be honest, actually I probably will vote to stay in, but for me, um, it's an issue of cultural and political, social significance. Actually, the economics is far less material than you might think. So, overall, uh, the budget yesterday provides a marginal boost to businesses and consumers, but it's at the expense of what is an, an unrealistically tough fiscal consolidation in 2019-20. Uh, the recovery has gathered pace over the past two years, with retail and especially online benefiting. There are, of course, though, substantial risks to con continued progress, some of our own making, like the wretched Brexit votes, and some of which, which are out of our control, such as China. Markets and other commentators are unnerved, and possibly rightly so, but they're not necessarily right. And on the balance of probabilities, we think that a United Kingdom recovery and consumer growth will be sustained, albeit not at particularly massive levels, but nevertheless, hold on tight. Thank you very much.